2012 or 2013, we had some garbanzos seeded uh, on some, some land that's the furthest north stuff that we farm. And uh, uh, they just uh, came up real nice, beautiful stand, but they just did not perform. We were getting poorer and poorer yields. It was harder to establish a stand when seeding a crop, whether it be a perennial like Kentucky bluegrass or an annual like wheat. And we noticed that some of the legumes, we, we just kind of assumed that there were certain areas that we couldn't grow legumes. The most severe symptoms I've seen of, uh, was in the uh, garbanzo crop. Um, and we saw a lot of root clubbing and just stunted plants. What originally started this was I went to a grower meeting that Kim Kidwell was speaking at and she said that she was developing a variety of wheat that was resistant to rhizoctonia. And she described what rhizoctonia would look like in the field and how you would have the stunting and the yellowing of the plants and a very low yield and possibly even uh, uh, death of the, of the wheat plant. So I went up to her and spoke to her after the meeting and I said, I have the perfect place for you. We have this rhizoctonia that's so bad that we, we can't even grow any spring wheat at all. She brought her wheat up there along with several different varieties and planted them in a test plot and they all pretty much died. Most of our pathogens like rhizoctonia and pythium, they'll rot the root away. Uh, you'll see lots of brown roots, but they'll never cause this distortion. Most of our soil-borne pathogens don't change the morphology of the root. The one exception with that may be cereal cyst nematode, where at the feeding site you have this proliferation of roots that comes up. A lot of people, when they go out to look at symptomology, the first thing they jump to is a herbicide, but a lot of times there's other things that it could be instead or it could be an interaction of several factors coming together and you have to kind of tease those out. It's not real easy to just look sometimes and, and know you have herbicide injury. We kind of learned the hard way on a few fields where we would go in and seed something say such as camelina. We tried that and, and it's very sensitive to herbicide carryover. Camelina would come up and die and so after a few fields and a few different crops, having that kind of a, an issue occur, we decided it'd be much cheaper if we were to take soil samples and, and do a bioassay in the shop in the winter time. Root symptomology of herbicides that affect roots are a stunting or nubbing. You tend to affect the mitotic area of the root, so that portion of the root that's growing real actively, it, it doesn't grow very well, so you get short little nubby roots. Above ground symptomology, depends also on the herb, particular herbicide. Sometimes you get a, a bending or twisting. A lot of times it's just a yellowing and a shortening of the inner nodes, and so your plants don't get as tall. 70% of the herbicides we use here in the inland Pacific Northwest are weak acid herbicides, and so as the pH of the soil declines, it will bind more tightly, less of the product will be available, and more of it will last longer. And so that's the case. Uh, with PowerFlex herbicide. This was a herbicide that when it first came out had very short soil residual, very short rotation restrictions to further crops. But after using it in the P&W for a couple of years, we started to see carryover issues. And that's because our soil pHs were so low, so much of the herbicide was no longer negatively charged. It was now neutrally charged and it was binding to the soil and not breaking down nearly as fast as it was in other soils and places where they had tested the product. Later on with more intensive soil sampling, we found some areas, some zones that were down in the 4.8 pH range. Um, and I really think that the, the low yield on those garbanzos was attributable to the low pH. We knew our pH was low, but it never connected the dots. You know, never, never realized that it would cause us that much problem. You may in fact have interactions where you have synergistic effects where the damage from uh, the, the low pH or whatever may couple with damage from rhizoctonia or nematodes or anything else. So you end up having even more damage than you would if you put either of the two together. I look at this low pH problem as, in a way, kind of a canary in a coal mine. Once we, once we understood that there was uh, some pH issues here, I started doing some more reading, uh, different soils manuals. and. Uh, Essentially, everything I read said first thing you need to do 
soil fertility wise is to address your pH issues and uh, that uh, you know that really struck a nerve with me.